Hey everyone, we are live. Thank you for joining, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching after the event, um, thank you very much. Um, today, it's great to be get, to be joined by Glenn Guttmacher. Have I pronounced your name right? Yes. All good. Awesome, awesome. So for those that don't know Glenn, um, he's the VP Talent Sourcing and Recruitment Marketing at State Street. So he is like super expert at all things sourcing, sourcing tech, all of that stuff. Well, that's what you told me anyway, before we uh, before we came on. Um, and also actually he's leaving State Street, FYI. So if any um, awesome companies need an amazing sourcer, then Glenn is your man. Um, Glenn, thanks for joining me. Sure, thank you, Lewis. Happy to Pleasure. chat. Pleasure. So where, where are you in the world? I think we're good to start start there actually. Yes. Well, I live about halfway between the two lovely New England cities of Boston and Providence. Ah, so you got some snow now? You got a little dump of snow recently? We still have a little left to melt, yes. Fine, fine. Well, I'm in sunny London. Spring's in the air. Um, vaccine's been rolling out. So everyone's on a little positive vibe, I think, now here, which is cool. Yeah, I we finally have it now where every adult can sign up. It used to be broken out in cohorts by age or other conditions. So I think now we're going to see a rapid uh, deployment of the vaccine. Yeah, true. So I wanted to go deep into what tech people are using to source and from, from multiple aspects. So we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, and then we can just think also a little bit about we'll discuss you know, what that means for people looking for a job. So the experience that people are having. I've had loads of questions, as I mentioned a little bit off air, about people's negative experiences. For some reason, I rarely hear about good experiences with these things. <laughs> but, you know, that's what they say, right? People always speak about bad experiences. So we'll go into that. And also, and I know you're heavily involved in this as well. We'll talk a little bit about, about DNI as well and, and certainly like what tech is doing on that front. So... What if just to start up, what are you what, what what's what are you using right now? Like have you well so of course I'm at a highly regulated bank, so it's not the ideal environment for trying uh cool new stuff because of course when you oversee 15% of the world's financial assets, you've got to be super secure about uh what goes in and out of your tech uh flow. So um there are things that I would like to implement at scale that I'm still trying to get justified. Uh, but uh, for example, I think it might, what would you love to? Well, I would love to have a CRM, for example, uh, <laughs> which you would think companies of our size would have. Um, so, but there are surprisingly a lot of firms that have the same issues we do because uh, there are other industries besides finance that are highly regulated. Pharma, you know, being a, a good one. Uh, so. In those circumstances, you can do some workarounds. So your ATS, if it's configured well, you know, can handle uh, electronic communications at scale. Uh, it's not ideal because it tends not to support imagery or video, which some of the newer tools out there, which I've, I've certainly played with a lot of them, and I will use them on my own personal machines uh, if I need to. Uh, but it's tough in that case because I'm still not able to send it out as the brand of my employer, which is what they would okay. prefer. So yeah. that's uh, my limitation. But you, know, you can go back, frankly, to like 2010. And there were some really interesting tools that uh, were available even then that now I think frankly, we're so pioneering, it just took a while for the rest of the industry to catch up. So my yeah. previous firm, uh, Avanade, which is a joint venture of Accenture and Microsoft, probably 2 billion revenue at the time, maybe right. a little more now. So there, we were able to leverage something called Inside Connector, which is still around, insideconnector.com. It was created by a guy in Atlanta, shout out to John Bryant, still in our industry. Um, got some developer help offshore, you know, to make something yeah. work. And what I like about it, and it's, again, it's still some aspects not used today. So what is common to a lot of the tools in this space is, you know, you're able to present to a prospect a mix of imagery, video, documents, all in a personalized landing page. 
What they did, which I thought was pretty cool, is that it automatically generated a hyperlink in the initial outreach email with their full name in the URL. So nice. it looked personalized from the get-go. Uh, so it was more likely that people would click on that link. Yeah. Um, and I still see very few vendors that have incorporated that functionality. I would think, boy, if you want to get somebody to click on a link, wouldn't it be better if it had their mm -hmm. name in it? Um, seems like a no-brainer to me. Uh, anyway, so, so, that's interesting. So you're so so you so, so think about like maybe the the um, like the candidate flow, if you like. So you're you're you've been using tech or outreach tech to actually source and and engage and headhunt people. Yeah, I think it's important for passive talent in particular, right? Because they get a lot of spammy outreaches from recruiters, frankly, where all they've done is search on one or two keywords and then everyone in those search results gets a message, which is ridiculous because we know how many false positives you can have. Yeah, because you do get you get these um, email automation tools, right? Where you can, you can pre-write an email you can like whack in loads of email addresses and it just pings it out. Um, but interestingly, and we spoke about this again off air, I've had, I had a couple of people yesterday, they were like, I received an email from an internal recruiter asking me to, if I wanted to apply for a role. Um, and it was like, dear X, 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 you know, and then like a little, so it was like, mm, how many other emails have you sent to people like this? Yeah, I mean, at the very least, you should be looking at whatever online footprint you have about the person before you send the message just to justify that it's legit. I mean, there, was, there are some Facebook groups, you know, that are very active among recruiters and sourcers, and they put up these example templates all the time. Yeah. And clearly, it's going to irrelevant people, these jobs. And I, I can't imagine. So anyway, the, the good news is you're talking about tech that we use today. So we do have a number of licenses with Seekout, uh, which I think is pretty popular out there nowadays. For, for those that don't know what that is? Sure. Um, so Seekout.io is their URL. They're one of the profile aggregators, as they call them. So there are a bunch of vendors in this space, you know, Intello, HireTool. Um, you know, they're... There are others that I, I think like are Lusha or something. Is that Lusha? Well, that's a little different, right? Because that's more of a contact info finding tool as opposed to a full fledged aggregator. And what I mean by that, and, and this space, by the way, was pioneered by a vendor called Talent Bin, B I N, which has since been bought by Monster and frankly has not been maintained so well since that acquisition. But anyway, what is good about these tools is they don't just look at the public LinkedIn profile, which they have in their system, but they're also pulling in data from GitHub, sometimes uh, other major social networks. Uh, in the case of Seekout, they're very big on uh, not just GitHub, but the uh, patents and papers that people publish and integrating okay. all of that into a well-rounded candidate profile so that when you're looking at information about them, you have so much more to go on. So your messaging can be much more personalized because you can incorporate all those things as merge fields in the outreach. And that's the other nice piece about Seekout is you can actually send the messaging from within that tool. And to be fair, the other major tools in this space also allow you to do uh, yeah. drip marketing kinds of campaigns, but to have the search tool with the hundreds of millions of profiles integrated with the outreach, I think is very powerful. Amazing. And so is that, is that you guys use that? You've used that for a while, presumably. Yeah. So the, the, again, the, because of our restrictions as a highly regulated company, I'm not able to get permission to connect it with our Outlook Exchange server, which would allow me to actually send it all from within the tool. Oh, okay. But what Seekout does nicely, not all the tools do, is I can just copy the personalized template that it generates. And in one click, I can paste it into my Outlook client with all those merge fields and hit send. And now it's going out just like any other email. Amazing. It's so crazy, right? If you're, if you're someone looking for a role right now, it's just outstanding how much information you don't even realize is online. You know, posting stuff. I mean, it's just crazy because there's been obviously a lot of dialogue over the years about personal data and availability of data and all of those things. 
Yeah, well, that, so that's interesting, right? These tools are usually quite savvy about things like GDPR, and then the state of California has something called CCPA that are around data privacy. So you actually have different degrees of data that you can access depending on where you're searching. So oh, the, yeah, the interface in Seekout when you're searching Europe is different than when you're searching North America, for example. Okay, I think it's amazing. I mean, it's good thing. It's it's great stuff. Certainly for us when we're sourcing, you just get such rich information and data about people and then you can be really personalized, whether it's the personalized initial outreach or once actually when you've started to engage with them and now we're actually having a conversation. Um, well, I think the first thing you need to make sure is that your tool will allow you to personalize the subject line because not all of them do. Even LinkedIn is notorious in their in-mails. You can put a few merge fields in the body of the message, but nothing in the subject line. But think about your candidate receiving messages. Usually it's just a list of subject lines, right? So if I can stand out yeah. from that list, why wouldn't I put their first name, for example, in the subject line? So uh, someone else said that to me. It's funny that you didn't finally mention that. Someone said to me the other day, um, the highest open rate of these kinds of things is when you put their name in like the person's name oh, in yeah. the subject. You find that too? Absolutely. Interesting. Why the is The other that? thing I would, well, I think everyone, you know, at their fundamental psychological level likes to be acknowledged, right? So mm -hmm. even in a conversation, um, the good phone sourcers will tell you the way to get through the gatekeepers to get the information that you want is to throw in the name of the person periodically in your discussion because it just subconsciously increases yes. the rapport, gets them more comfortable with you. Yeah, 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 definitely. Very interesting. Yeah, and then so once once you've, and so in terms of hit rate, so you're sending out 10, are you, you, you're seeing how, what's the kind of usual rate of, uh, of reply when you're doing the name, when you've done your nice personalized message? So if it's to a list that I know is relevant to what I'm, sharing information about, it should be in the neighborhood of 40% on the first okay. go. And of course, if you want to increase that, then you want to reach out to them in a different channel. So if I'm sending an in-mail message, then I'm going to send a seek out or other email message at the same time or in close succession. Um, obviously, if I have their uh, mobile number and I can text them, that's a bonus. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So you, you typically want to you, create a sequence. Would you text them before you email them? No, I don't think text should be your first method of outreach. Uh, with some job function exceptions, admittedly, I don't do much in medical, but I hear it works well for some job functions. Um, yeah, I think you just have to know your audience and, and test. You know, A-B testing, yeah. not just with your message content, but which channels you use in which order will tell you a lot. Definitely. Um, what, do, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on these voice notes that you get on, say, LinkedIn, where you can send? I've had quite a lot of like sales voice notes. Yeah, I, I think um, that can, it could be effective. Um, uh, the, I, I mean, I was happy when they added the ability to add attachments to your in-mail messages, which didn't exist for many years. Um, you know, there, if there's anything, I guess you can add that you think is going to help you stand out from the crowd, yeah. it's worth trying. Yeah, no, true. Very true. What do you think, what's it like for the, for the, for the candidates, the experience? Because a lot of, you can often tell if it's a, if it's a, like a, a batch outreach, even though it's been personalized, you know, well, you can still. I, so I would say yes and no. Um, I think if a form email has a few relevant merge fields in it and you've done a good job sifting beforehand and i cannot emphasize enough how important it is to match your messaging to the target list there's so much junk being sent out to irrelevant it's irrelevant jobs to the the people that frankly it doesn't take a lot to look like good messaging with so yeah. much junk out there so when it's clear that you've sent the right kind of thing to the right person, right? It, they, it's not that they've got Java in their history from 10 years ago, but now they're doing something completely different. 
you know, but you're talking about getting another Java position. Like, why would you send that to them if the last time they used it was 10 years ago? Come on. Yeah, that's true. That's true. What about just one stepping back one, one level to actually finding people? Um, and I think sure. it's really relevant because there's a lot of people currently, you know, unfortunately out of work, looking for a role, things like that. And I know you've been going through the job search as well. So it'd be great to hear your perspective on that. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the if you're if a firm is using tech, you know, some kind of AI or you know, really an algorithm that they've that they've developed. How can you how can you as a job seeker like make yourself get found more? So I think if you were a victim of a layoff, make sure you are on those layoff lists that a lot of companies have put out there. Uh, there are also a few really good aggregated ones. Uh, layoffs.fyi, I think would be a good one to include as a resource. Um, oh, and then in addition to layoffs.fyi, there's something called drafted.us, um, which admittedly skews more American, but um, I believe also does have European listings in there. So what those two sites have done is aggregate all of these layoff lists and make right. it easy for candidates to be found as well as uh, obviously the sourcers and recruiters to find the talent. Um, the other thing is certainly to make sure that your application um, is properly keyword loaded to match the job description you're applying for. And there are unfortunately way too many candidates that will use the same version of their CV for every job they apply to, yeah. which you might as well be throwing it in the garbage can, I hate to tell you, um, <laughs> because applicant tracking systems do depend on keyword matching. Um, very few of them are savvy enough to you know, match on synonyms for skills. So look at the job posting first and just make sure those keywords are in your CV. And if you have to rephrase things slightly, hey, it's worth the effort because at least you will make it through that first level of automation and get actually read by the recruiter. Absolutely. So you yeah, absolutely. So those that, you know, you're it takes a bit of time to even get to the human uh, basically is what you're saying right it comes in to the system the algorithm sifts them and then you know the recruiter might have like 500 applications i mean if you look on linkedin at some of these jobs i mean there's like thousands right oh so, for us too sure yeah so you can't look at each one so obviously there's some there's some automation so so you're right thinking about what keywords you can put in to let let the computer let you through to the human behind it that can actually look into your profile in a little bit more detail. I would add one other important tactic that a lot of job seekers don't do is you should be searching LinkedIn to find someone likely to be in the hiring team for the position you're applying to and just send them a connection invitation. Don't even mention the fact you're applying on a job first. I would just send a nice connection invite to say, hey, your company's interesting. You look interesting. I mean, there's better ways to say it, but the point is just get them to accept your connection request because then you're going to see their contact info and then you have the ability to follow up later to say, oh, I saw this really great job at your company. I'm going to apply. Um, you know, do you think this, you know, makes sense? Um, and in a lot of cases, they will tell you, no, no, don't apply online yourself. Go through me because in order for that employee to get their referral bonus, they may have a different process to submit your application. Interesting. Do you know, it's funny that I'm, you're right, completely right. And a lot of people ask this. Um, it's, I was going to do a, I was going to do one of my uh, espressos as, and I just talked to myself for about 50 minutes, but a lot of people are like, should I, if I've applied via an advert or applied via their website, um, should I also connect to the internal recruiter? Or if there's a headhunter managing the process, should I connect with them? Should I send them a message? So I'm doing one at the moment. We're doing this this uh, couple of searches for a firm, and we're managing that whole process of so the advertising and the headhunting and stuff. And I've actually had quite a few people that have sent me a nice, really nice connection request on LinkedIn with a uh, like a personalized written note to me, saying, you know, dear Lewis, I see you're managing the process for this search. Um, I'd love to have a chat with you. And that, and 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 it actually it works, right? Because suddenly I'm like, oh, okay. And then you, you check them out and they're in your mind. You can't help it. I'm, a, I'm human. I can't get them out. <laughs> so. yeah. 
Well, it's so, a little bit different for you, right? Because being a third party recruiter, you're the liaison into that whole organization. So yeah. for it makes sense in your case to go through the recruiter. I'm saying if you're going to apply directly to a company, I actually would not prioritize the recruiter. I'd be looking for someone who works functionally that. in a similar right. thing to that job because I think they will appreciate your skill set more. And again, you need to be outside HR to qualify for the employee referral bonus. If you send it, your CV oh. through a recruiter, no one's making any extra money off that. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, that's true. That's true. Also, just forgetting the, the money side of it as well. Um, and I've said this before, like LinkedIn is such an amazing tool. Um, like you, you can dive in, you can search for, and if I want to work in banking, for example, right, I can, I can search in the search string, like banking, solvency two, whatever it might be, insurance. I, I can source it by content and like millions and millions and millions of pieces of content with the relevant stuff that I'm looking for come up. And I can start liking and commenting on the people that come up. And these are the people that I probably want to work for, right? And you start engaging, you send them a connection request, you see they might be hiring. And suddenly like, like who's this guy that keeps liking all my stuff and making nice comments? Oh, he's yeah. applied for, great, like let's get him in. Brilliant, you know. So it does work like it's and you, know, you can do it from your house you don't even have to go to a uh, a cocktail party <laughs> anymore to network yeah you know i think it's such an, a great a great opportunity right now to do that yeah i i would recommend that frankly for any level like even if you're coming right out of school you can use that whole approach of oh you know i'm new to the industry i just graduated from x university um you know your career path looks really interesting to me and they will accept those connection requests in many cases. And that starts to become the seed of the network that you're going to use later in your career. Yeah. And frankly, I'd be connecting to your recently graduated peers because five years from now, everyone's going to be in a totally different place that could be very helpful to you. Yeah, the hut, so true. So true. And now it's so easy to stay in touch with people. I mean, when I was at uni, I'm going to sound, oh, I can't even believe I said that when I was at uni back in the day. Um, you know, I think Facebook had just started or it just started like the year or two I was leaving uni. So if I think to my school friends, for those that are watching that I haven't stayed in touch with, I wish I did. I just, you know, but now you can, you can stay in touch with anyone. And when you leave jobs and you move on, like make sure you stay connected to your peers. So many people get jobs through people that they used to work with. You know, like yeah. they know you, they know what you're about and things like that. So it's super important. I think people don't necessarily give the proper weight to realizing that, hey, if you were just socially friendly with someone in high school or university and now you're thinking about a career, they're not necessarily going to know your competence in that field. But if you're now in the same industry as that other person and you want to go through them to get a connection to a job, they're usually willing to do it just because they have a good memory of you as a person. Forget the skills. Oh, yeah. Because also, you know, we're we're human and we're all biased and we always think we're a better judge of someone if they've like had a similar upbringing, right? If we've gone to the same school together, you know, we feel like we know what we're about. And also the other thing is if you've been friends with someone, like friends would quite like to hire people that they know and that they like. Yeah. Well, of course, now you're getting into the whole sphere of what's called affinity bias, which in DNI can be actually a problem. But absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. no, absolutely. Before we move on to DNI, though, let's just talk about the other the other side of this, which is so many people complain that they they apply to a job online through a website, through LinkedIn, whatever, and they just they just never hear back ever. So so this and this candidate experience bit, which which for me is like fundamental. Uh, to, to the jobs that we do, um, it just gets lost, I think, you know, like it's easy to get it wrong. Well, I guess it, I, it's hard to know what you would do in a situation where, and this is true at my company, where I we will literally get thousands of applicants for a job. So sure, you can add some uh, pre-screening questions, which will help rank the results, uh, but still, you know, if you only have one recruiter supporting that, and remember, they've got probably dozens of other jobs concurrently that they're handling. I don't know how a job seeker can realistically expect to get through all of those applications. So that's why you've got to leverage these other things we're talking about to give yourself an edge. Yeah, yeah. 
No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I was thinking because I was thinking about you have this kind of, kind of can I've this candidate bill of rights. I mean, it's not nothing new, but it's 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 useful to think about when you're hiring. And, and I always find people miss this: is what level of service um, should you reasonably give to a candidate, or what what should they the candidate reasonably expect? You know, whether it's an automated email, if they've had an interview, should they get a phone call back with feedback? And you know, I think it's 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 useful to have that that kind of process in place. Yeah, I think there are some really nice templates that I've seen generated by some of the applicant tracking systems that um, go to the people who are rejected. Uh, but I do agree that there's a big difference in white glove service you should be providing is as candidates move up a level. So if you actually did read the CV, um, you know there should be something that speaks to what you picked out from that, that you liked or didn't like, that can be part of the response. Uh, the same thing if you make it to the first uh, interview, whether it's with a recruiter or a hiring manager, clearly there needs to be more uh, white glove treatment at that point as well. Yeah, Because if, if you make it to that level, frankly, you're qualified for something in that organization, even if you didn't get that particular job, right? So you want to keep warm uh, on that relationship. And of course, they probably have friends that are qualified. So you'd like to treat them as a good referral source. Definitely. But people don't. There's a cl classic, classic complaint from everyone. You know, I've been ghosted. They haven't got back to me. I haven't had the feedback. You know, so we need to get better at that. Well, we know that that kind of buzz gets around both positive and negative, right? It's the yeah. same thing if you're in sales and you're trying to close a new account versus renewing an existing account, the amount of extra effort that's required to get new business compared to referral business is insane. So to take that analogy to recruiting, like if I've developed a relationship with a candidate to some extent, to be able to get them in the process later is going to be so much easier or get a referral out of them than to try to approach a completely new passive candidate. Definitely. No, no, so true. That's so true. What do you think now? So, you know, the application has gone through a bit. What are, what are your thoughts on, on the video CVs? And Yeah, well, I think there's two ways to look at video, right? First, we need to look from the outreach perspective because too many messages from recruiters and sourcers are text only. And I think we, in this age, we should be leveraging imagery and video, which by the way, can be personalized. So there's some really good technology out there to support that. I've demoed a few vendors uh, in that category. Uh, and, and you really should look at things like Lemlist, for example, um, where Lemlist. you can, yeah, like Lemon, but Lemlist. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what, what these kinds of tools do is they will take those personalized merge fields that we've been talking about and superimpose them on images. So you can now make things look really visually interesting and personalized in your outreach, which again, if they're used well, uh, should have a much higher response rate than the equivalent text only message. Awesome, so what, you would, what would you do? Would you embed that in your initial outreach? Email? Yeah, absolutely. So some people, you know, nowadays everyone talks about having the virtual cup of coffee with somebody. So great, go get your Starbucks cup, but put the name of the candidate on the cup, right? That's a typical one that's used out there. Um, that. And then would that be a little gif and like just embed that in the email and it would right. be something like... It's, it's automatically like done and um, it can be done at scale. It can be done, you know, message by message either way. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. What about the interview? The the like the video CV. Like yeah, I, I think that's another interesting category. Um, as long as it gives the candidate the opportunity to re-record their answers, I I don't like yeah. the ones where it's just a one chance and you're done. Because yeah. especially for someone who's not a regular interviewer or they have some neurodiversity issue, those kinds of folks tend not to do well on camera the first time. So why wouldn't you give them the chance to be their best self and, and re-record? So yeah, go ahead. How, in, how in, this on, on the DNI thing then, how inclusive is that? Because some people, they're not, they don't want to be on camera. Like they don't want to, they don't want to do what we're doing here, right? They're, they're, it's, I mean, that's quite, it's quite a big thing to, to press record on your, 
on your car on your camera and, and and send you're sending a video of yourself you don't you know you might be self-conscious you don't know what the background's like maybe you don't have anywhere nice to record you're in your bedroom because you're in a, a shared flat or something i mean yeah well I, I the good news is nowadays most tools will give you the ability to superimpose a different background um yeah, i think true. those can sometimes look a little cheesy which is why we're probably not using it uh but um but I, I think the the key is to practice, right? So even if you are somewhat on the spectrum and you tend not to come across well with video, um, you can still do a lot better if it's your 10th attempt at answering something than your first. So if you need to practice in front of a mirror, um, if you want to do it with a trusted friend, uh, who can give you candid feedback, but gently guide you in you know positive directions. You can certainly be much better, but to say it's a level playing field, no, the extroverts, of course, are gonna look better in a video interview. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, you know, if you, you tailor it depending on the type of type of position you're hiring for, right? I mean, you know. Yeah, I would hope can... that the hiring managers are sensitive enough to realize that, hey, I'm probably looking at an introvert's video right now, so I'm not gonna put too much weight on their polish but i will look a little closer at their skills and the content of their answers yes yeah yeah one step further than that i i, I trialed a thing called we are human i think it's that right we are human and so it's a video interview so you send them like for however many questions and they record themselves and then the the algorithm the ai then um scans their face and then produces a personality report based on their facial uh, expressions I'm maybe. definitely worried about those. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 mean, like, I mean, maybe it was their marketing and material, but um, seemed quite accurate. Like they were saying it was accurate. I mean, yeah. You know. I, well, of course, emotions are sometimes revealed. Uh, if you speak to the neuro linguistic programming experts, um, sometimes negatively referred to as the social engineers, um, those folks can detect that kind of stuff, like you're lying based on a twitch in your eye and things like that. I mean, to get really good at that, you have to have been doing it for many years. I mean, we're talking, you know, the government types of people that do this kind of investigation. Sure, they can probably get it right, but not, even they don't get it right 100% of the time. Well, let me tell you, we're, I'm listening to, if you, oh, I'm saying I'm listening because I'm doing an audio book, but um, Malcolm Gladwell, um who's famous guy great great author and he's just done i mean it was actually a bit of time ago talking to strangers so i'm listening to the audio book on audible um which is quite cool because it's like a book plus it's kind of like a podcast straight audio book and he goes into all of this and let me tell you you can be trained as anything but it's 50 50. most people don't know whether someone's lying or not really you just yeah it's it's, it's really interesting you think you know you think you're a good judge of someone you know, like you have it in the gut. I just, I just know that person's lying or telling the truth and stuff. But in reality, it's like pretty much 50-50. And that's why the interviewing process needs to be thorough and consistent across all candidates because it's very easy for the literally dozen different forms of bias to creep into the interview process. As soon as it starts getting subjective and you say, oh, I'm going to give a person a pass on this because uh, they don't have the skill, but it's okay because, hey, uh, they remind them of me 10 years ago and I figured it out on the job, so they'll be able to figure it out too. And then, of course, the diverse candidate who does not remind them of themselves has that same deficiency and they're like, oh, no, we can't proceed with this candidate because they don't know this. Like, wait a second, you can't be doing double standards like that. Oh, it's so crazy. I had a guy, um, it's only a bank actually as well, and so they were doing a trial, like he knew it was a test. He knew it was going on. So he was asked to interview two people and it was filmed by HR and stuff. And uh, so anyway, the two candidates, one candidate came in like dressed, like really slick suit, beautiful tie, like just fitted in perfectly to this bank, right? And the guy did the interview, fine. Next one comes in, jeans and a t-shirt, right? Just, just not suited to a bank whatsoever. Did the interview. They all knew it was recorded, and then the the HR uh, professional asked, "So, which which one was better?" Ah, the first one. Oh, how come? Just you know, the answers were perfect, structured well, had obviously taken the time to some played the video back, and it awful, awful answers. 
the second one actually was much better but this this bias that you're talking about like the minute they walked in the room they wanted to like them and it was really hard for the interviewer to get that out of their head and we know there are a bunch of courses out there many are free in fact there's one on linkedin by a woman named dr tana sessions which i think is really good uh that talks about the 12 different forms of bias that creep into the interview process specifically and unless you're going to consciously check yourself after each interview and frankly you should do it at the beginning of the interview to say hmm is there anything that i'm not critically evaluating objectively here like wait, I, I, I have a first impression. Everyone's going to have a first impression, yeah, right? Yeah. So using your example, right? Yeah, they look good. Am I going to let this looking good part influence the rest of this interview? Like, no, I'm going to focus on the content. So as long as you can catch yourself that way so that you don't get carried away in the wrong direction, you can still have a good interview process and have people that look very different, act very different, and make the right hiring decision in the yeah. end. Have you got, do you use any that really cool tech that helps to make the interview process like fairer? So, I mean, I've, I've again, dabbled in a, a number of tools. Uh, we have not adopted a coding assessment across the board, for example, which I think for technical roles is a good idea as long as they're uh, the kinds of tests that would make sense in your environment. I wouldn't take yeah. just the generic coding test. Uh, it should be realistic. There are some scenario-based testing environments out there. I know Walmart is very famous for using that for their store managers and apparently works pretty well. Uh, it's a whole virtual environment. That stuff is going to all get cheaper and more commonly available because soft skills, frankly, are harder to measure than hard skills. Yes. So that's going to take the longest time to do well. That's true. And I think they're, so, they're, they're most important. I've been, I've been talking about this for a long time, you know, looking for people who are kind, empathetic, motivated, you know, things like that. You know, so like hiring for high potential over pedigree, which is, which is I think, what we're talking about here. And the good behavioral interview methods, you know, Amazon is famous for this, right? You're going to describe a problem situation, you're going to describe how you, uh, what behaviors or actions you took, and then the impact at the end, right? And if you can probe through that three-step process, you should be able to figure out where you're being snowed in the conversation and dig down to find out, you know, what was their specific role? Did they really own this? Uh, As opposed to the people who may have been on the periphery of something, and then you can get to a point where you can feel pretty confident that this person can legitimately do the job. Yes, yes, that's true. And then you're, you've been quite involved in that. I know you've got, um, you have an, uh, um, an organization you've set up, right? A website you've set up with for DNI and. Yeah. So uh, we started this last year. And every two weeks, it's on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it's 4 p.m. New York time, which admittedly is a little late in the evening, though we did have a UK-based presenter uh, a couple of Fridays ago. So it's, you know, might be an interesting way to cap your week. Uh, what we do is we have uh, typically about two to three dozen folks show up live, and we have a rotating expert presenter. It's been someone different every two weeks talking about some aspect of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging uh, applied to a talent acquisition context because all our attendees are professionals in talent acquisition with DEI as part of their mandate. And the discussions have been really great. Um, You know, we're not expecting the guest uh, presenter to be a presenter. Actually, they're more of a facilitator. So they may talk for sometimes a few minutes, sometimes most of the session, but by the end of the hour, we've also had plenty of dialogue between all the members and Q&A, so you feel like you're coming away with a much better understanding of that aspect of the field. Awesome. There's so much great stuff going on in that space right now, Um, and also I feel with tech, there's just so many things you can do to make people feel included, um, give them the opportunity to you know, apply for these types of positions that they want to apply for. I think it's 
some good stuff going on. Yeah. Well, the other part of video that we didn't talk about, which I think is important, is how you're portraying your organization in that outreach. And if you just say, all right, I'm going to create one person of color video about our company, and that's what we send out all the time, and you think, great, I've checked the box, I'm done. No, 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 no. You've got to think about what is the scope of roles by job function that you want to reach out about. Think about all the kinds of diversity that matter in your organization. And you should have a whole video library, frankly, of things to choose from so that your sourcers and recruiters who do that initial outreach don't look like a one trick pony sending out the same okay. thing every time because yeah. it does not authentically convey the range of what you're trying to achieve, at least it, it shouldn't, because uh, if you yeah. do keep sending the same thing all the time, you know, that's not going to create a great impression in the marketplace. True. What do you think? Last question here. What do you think about blind CVs? And if you're doing video, how, how do you feel that works? Well, first, I want to make sure people start using the term masked CVs. Masked, I don't like okay. blind because, of course, there's a potential negative connotation around uh, disability diversity there. There's nothing blind about it. It's what we're saying is if you want to make the recruiting process more fair, let's mask out information that might give away your diversity category, which could potentially negatively impact your candidacy with some hiring managers. I'm hoping there will be a day when it won't matter. But at the moment, yeah, there are some companies where if you see a very ethnic sounding name atop the resume, that may create an initial negative bias for some people looking at that resume. And you wouldn't, I mean, there've been studies, right, have shown this. You can take two exactly the same resumes and just change the name at the top and the evaluation of the candidate's competency can be very different. So yeah. we know the bias is out there. So if we can hide things, not just the ethnicity elements, but even years, you know, like when you went to school, right? It's fine to put, you went to a given university, but why do I need to say that it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago? That's not important, but, but it could lead to ageism. Ageism bias is out there. You're right. But, but the thing with that and the mask the CV resume is at some point people are going to know, right? So it doesn't really solve the problem, does it? It's it solves get it at the first round. So remember, we've got thousands of applicants, right? So if you can make it through on a more fair basis at that point, so at least you get seen. Sure, at some point, someone's going to see who you are and they're going to figure out some things about diversity. But at least at that point, it's a pretty level playing field. You're being, you know, You've looked at your merits now. It's yeah. not some machine that knocked you out uh, or, or some invisible evaluation that happened that you don't know why you weren't considered. So actually, so actually, with the, with 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 AI or a te piece of technology doing the first sifting, depending on how it's been programmed, I mean, actually, that's that's a that's a good thing. It won't be looking at, you know, where, how your name's spelled or, you know, necessarily where you grew up and things like that. It's do they have the skills? Have you put the keywords in? Great. Okay, you've made it to the long list, and then a human starts to have a look. Yeah, I think the thing you have to worry about is some of the tools out there will look at your demographics for the people who have done well in the role up to that point in your company. Right. So where inadvertently some bias can creep in is what if all the high performers on that job function were all male? Your AI tool may assume that being male is a beneficial characteristic for application. So you need to look closely at the rules in the algorithm to make sure that things like that are not part of the equation. We can program that out. You know, we gotta, we, of yeah. course you can. Yeah. 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 I mean, that kind of stuff. So I think it's good. I mean, you know, if it's, if it's used well, certainly for when you're having so many and so many applications, you get, you're right, you get through the first step and then, you know, all of this great work people are doing around DE and I, starting to cut to soak in and people will, will be will be more fair when selecting and going through to the next steps so right we've done 45 minutes so i think that's great thank you very much for uh for joining me um absolutely 
And good luck with your job search. And if anyone is looking for an amazing saucer, um, please give Glenn a shout. Well, admittedly, I'm not really the individual contributor anymore. I'm more like the guy who would structure your sourcing function, whether it's onshore, offshore, hybrid. So if you're looking for something more at the managerial level of sourcing systems that scale, uh, yeah, happy to talk to you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Thanks again, Lewis. See you soon. Thanks, everyone, for right. watching.